You're listening to a brain stew, fresh fright review. Your one microscopic cog in his catastrophic plan Designed and directed by his red right hand Turn. Yeah, what's up, creeps? Welcome back to another episode of Brain Stew Fresh Frights Review, baby Oh man, we've been sitting on this one for a week We've been uh, biting our nails wanting to talk about this one so very badly you guys have been asking, what did you guys think? What did you guys think? This is it, man. This is fucking it. But we had to wait because we wanted to bring someone very special. One of our dear friends on the show who is very much a Scream enthusiast. And I'm dying to find out her opinion as well. Uh, I am Jeremy. I'm Justin. And with us, we have the one and only... Well, first, she's a renowned cosplayer who is the definitive... Nancy Thompson from Nightmare on Elm Street cosplay. That's true. She's been yeah. featured in Fangoria magazine. She's done some independent horror films. One of the stars of the upcoming documentary Fred Heads and just launched her own YouTube show, Snacks and Screams. Deandra Laser, how are you? Whoop, whoop. I'm so excited to be here, guys. This has been, uh, yeah, it's definitely been a week and I'm, I've just been kind of sitting on it getting, like you said, all those messages. Everyone's like, what did you think of it? I'm like, I can't say. You got to listen to the podcast. You really do. Because I'm, I'm, I don't, I feel like I'm surprised by my own thoughts by this. I've been reading everybody else's thoughts. So I'm ready to let the cat out of the yeah, bag. Yeah, it's, it's been a week since Justin and I have seen it. Over, Over a, week. a week. since. Yeah, we, we saw it what, last Tuesday yeah, or something. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's been, it's been tough not talking about it because literally it went from the entire internet talking about Spider-Man nonstop to like everybody that's like, oh shit. Scream and this one, I wouldn't say it's divisive. I would say that majority of the people tend to dig most of it, a lot of it, or they love it. I'd say it's seventy five percent versus twenty five percent based on what I've for seen. Sure. Um, so it's something that I've been, uh, God, I've been looking forward to recording this so bad because I want to fucking talk about it. You know, it's been uh, a long time since we had a Scream movie. That was two thousand eleven, since Scream four. Over ten over, years. Over which... ten years. It took entirely too long. We did get two series. Uh, we had an MTV series that didn't last that long, and then we had an attempted reboot of that series, which was uh, unbearable to, to, to attempt to watch. Uh, the, the MTV series yeah. was was fine for what it was. A, a lot of people enjoyed it. A lot of people didn't. But finally, after so long, we have Hashtag for Wes, a return to one of Wes Craven's most iconic, most legendary, and most successful franchises of all time. So... I can't say enough as a huge Scream fan, like, I was there for this. I was waiting for this. I remember, like, waiting for this as soon as it was announced, like, immediately, like, posting a picture of Ghostface with, like, goosebumps going up my back, like, it's finally happening! We got Michael Myers' return, and I know what we're going to talk about, you know, throughout this episode. Yes, we would love to see Freddy return. Yes, we want to see Jason return, and, and seeing Ghostface return in such an epic fashion just means that it's we're that much further and closer to that happening. But yeah, super excited for this. And Deandra, thank you so much for coming on. It's an absolute honor to have you on tonight. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Um, you know, I've, I've been, I've, uh, listened to you guys, um, for a while while you've been doing this and it's just been so fun. And I just love hearing Jeremy sing the whole time. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, there it is. There's the music. <laughs> he has to do it now. He, it's a staple. He can't not do it. You know what's it. funny is I guarantee there's people that listen to this that are like, this motherfucker won't shut the fuck up and stop saying it. Man, I hope this dude shuts the fuck up, Fuck man. every episode, <laughs> fucking, fucking karaoke machine over here. <laughs> I had someone message us. I think it was Instagram or something. It was like, dude, your co-host came in so fucking loud that it scared the shit out of me. It will strip my coffee all over myself. I'm way to work. Because you came in so like, it's been a while. Dude. But yeah. <laughs> so, man, immediately you saying that reminded me of, uh, so there was a, a Newfound Glory album that came out a million years ago. I remember it was in high school. And 
you remember going to sleep with your headphones on, listening to an album on your, your fucking compact disc man <laughs> player? And uh, of course, dude, a lot of bands of had like secret tracks where like 20 minutes after the last song, there'd be like a secret hidden track. And that was always really cool, right? So I remember that one of their albums had a, a secret track that its sole intention was to scare the fuck out of people. It was like in the studio, they were like, Ah, and they all fucking screamed, and it, it was followed by, like, whispers. It was like, someone's in your house. Someone's in your house. And I fucking, dude, I remember falling asleep to that to that album and was passed out in that hit. So I apologize to, <laughs> to whoever it was that uh, I scared the fuck out of. No, it's yeah. good. I mean, it's a horror podcast. Yeah. If you're not frightened by something, whether it be my horrible takes on movies or Jeremy singing, <laughs> take what you will from what you're listening to. Um, I, I wanted to stop real quick before we actually get into the movie itself Jeremy I don't know if you wanted to talk about it or not but you actually had an experience on the set of oh. this movie right you 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 went Man. I don't know if you wanted to bring it up yeah, or not but you went and <laughs> you're, you're putting yeah. me uh, on the spot with that so yeah um I, a couple a couple little things so what's cool is that you know the radio silence guys that put out the uh the film uh ready or not which was fucking awesome a couple years ago they they did some stuff with the uh, VHS, that anthology series. They did Southbound. I, dude, I, I love those movies, man, all of them. So it's a small world because my cousin, she lives in Virginia Beach. And one day randomly she messaged me and was like, hey, I, I saw you post about this movie Southbound. And I was like, yeah, I, I love that movie. She was like, um, I'm really good friends with Chad Villiella's sister and I was like no way she was like yeah I've like hung out with him like I and he told me he did movie stuff and like I didn't think anything of it and then when you posted that so like he was super cool man this is pre-scream I hit him up and was just like hey man like I know you know my cousin or whatever and like that's really cool like I loved VHS and Southbound and it was actually this was before Ready or Not as well um he was so cool man because you know I collect autographs and I was like dude did you guys like get any full-size posters he mailed me Full size poster for VHS and a full size poster for Southbound, oh, wow. signed by nice. like everyone. So like I have all those guys autographs and shit. So when they announced that Scream Five or Scream Twenty Twenty Two as it's now Five Cream, yeah, Five Cream, Five Cream, Scrum, <laughs> Scrum. Um, so when they announced that it was them that was doing it, I like hit him up and was just like, "Dude, congratulations! Like a better group of people, you know, couldn't be doing this. Like I'm I'm so excited that you guys are the ones behind it." Or whatever. So, like, that was kind of my my little connection to it. I was like, oh, cool. Like, that dude knows my cousin. I've, like, chatted with him and shit like that. Um, He read that message after <laughs> they landed Scream 5 and, like, didn't reply. So, I'm like, ah, that's cool. You're busy. <laughs> it's fine. So, uh, yeah. So, while they were filming, um, me and two of my friends went out there. And uh, we went to the locations because it was already, like, public knowledge of, like, we went to, to Tara's house. You went to the Carpenter yeah, house. Yeah, we went to the Carpenter house. We went to Tara's house. And, like, we didn't know, you know, her character, how big the character was going to be, how small it was going to be. Is she just going to be, like, the opening kill character, you know, which has become synonymous with Scream. And so we just knew it was allegedly, from what the internet was telling us, going to be the house that the first, you know, killing takes place in. So we went... Th- well, the first kill. The first kill. So we went there. We took pictures. And we went to, you know, the location they used for Woodsboro High and, and stuff. So... It's heartbreaking, man, because I have a lot of like successful stories for me, like getting autographs and and going and doing really cool things. This was a swing and a fucking miss. So it didn't help. And it was the main culprit that COVID-19 is a thing, right? It exists. And while they were filming that movie, it was very much close to the the peak of COVID-19, like fear and shit like that. So we went, they were doing uh, exterior shots. It was a scene where um, Jack Quaid and um, uh, Sam, the character of Sam, were driving together. So we were there. It was public property and just hanging out. And apparently, and I found this out like a week later. So a week before we got there, a guy apparently had driven from like several states away to where they were filming. And he was like, hey, like, I'm a paparazzi, like, I'm going to be here taking pictures no matter what because you're on public property, and I'm allowed to do that. 
he was like, so let's work together and not against each other. So, th- and I read all this online because he had a blog. So, somebody from production came to him and was like, initially was like, no, like you can't take picture- pictures, period. And he was like, okay, then you have no, c- no content control. He goes, because you can't tell me I can't take pictures. I'm going to take as many pictures as I want. And it could be something that is potentially spoilerish because you're filming public, out in the public, out in the open. So he goes, or we could work together and I show you everything that I shot and you can approve it or deny it and I'll, de- I'll delete it if you deny it. He goes, but you have to tell me where you're filming and when you're filming. And so initially, I guess, they said, okay. And they told him, I guess, a couple days where they were going to be filming and stuff like that. And he went and he, and he shot pictures and showed them and they were cool. And then apparently one of these days, like they didn't contact him. He was like, what the fuck? And he's a smart guy, internet guy, found out where they were filming and showed up and was like, what the fuck? We had an agreement. You said that you were going to let me know when and where you were filming and you would have quality control. He goes, now I'm just going to shoot. And they were like, no, 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 no. It's cool. It's cool. Sorry. We fucked up. He goes, okay, cool. So again, all this information is from his blog. So then apparently, again, a few days later, they didn't give him the information, and they fucking called the police on him, and they had people that were in costume as police officers that they had come over to him, apparently, (laughs) and try to act like they were real police, and he was like, dude, you're, it literally says Uh, Woodsboro on your fucking thing, like, you're not a real police officer. Um, so... Dude, did they did they use some of the actors in the movie wearing I guess Girl police that, department according, costumes? According, <laughs> according to his blog, they did. So then he took wow. it a step further, right? This killer is taking it one step further. So he he went to like you know like a Best Buy or some shit like that, and he bought a fucking two way radio, and he found their frequency. So then, oh. out of spite, like they were, you know. Uh, by the way, we're going to be doing spoilers on on this episode. So if if you want this spoiler free, you got to listen. Listen, unless we put spoiler free in the fucking episode title, they know it's full of spoilers. I mean, everyone's pretty spoiler. much seen this movie already. Yeah, is Justin going to start you know telling people that they're terrible because they haven't seen it yet, like with Ghostbusters? <laughs> because I wasn't able to make it because I had to be like I was not able to be in the theater. This one I had to be first of all because I just wanted to be there and I had to avoid internet like repercussions. But then after listening to Justin be like, "Yeah, everybody will if they couldn't make it to Ghostbusters Afterlife," and I was like, "What the heck, Justin?" <laughs> I'm so one I of those guys. Them immediately. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those guys that we're going to be talking about those toxic you fucking fan toxic boys. fans. So, so this guy was pissed that that the studio ended their working relationship together. He got a two way radio, and allegedly on the radio they said that it was. Um, they were like, "Hey, we're we're ready to film the the West death scene. Ready to film the West death scene." So he leaked it. He leaked the fact he was like, "Hey, this character." Uh, West that's in the film is getting killed by Ghostface and Officer Judy rushes to try and save him. So like fans were like, oh shit, that must Judy must be Wes's mom. So like he leaked that shit. So anyways, fast forward to us being Oh, that's rough. That's yeah, dude. so rough. Yeah, hundred percent. So fast forward to us being there, right? So like we're hanging out. We have fucking scream shirts on. We're literally on public property and dude, like people were looking at us like we were the fucking the devil, the devil, and uh, a guy from production came over and was like, "What do you, what do you need?" And we're like, nothing. <laughs> like we're on public, we're on, <laughs> we're on public property, just like hanging out and and like, dude, they you got any of those five creams? You got some five creams for ice creams. <laughs> so like, dude, they were they were not happy with us being there, and it was it was very uncomfortable. Like we felt like you know that feeling where you feel like people are watching you and they're pissed. Like that's exactly how we felt, and we were like. All right, let's get the fuck out of here. So, so we got to see them film for a little bit and shit like that. We got to do the movie location stuff, but um, it was a situation. Had this been, you know, non-COVID status or, you know, I think this 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 paparazzi guy fucked it up anyways. Um, mm-hmm. They probably looked at us and thought that we were just like that guy, and they were like, we don't fucking want them here kind of deal. They're going to fuck this up mm-hmm. and do spoilers and stuff. Um but yeah, so that was that was my experience. I was there. I saw Jack Quaid and the chick that played Sam in a car driving down the street. It was really exciting filming. <laughs> Not really, but uh, 
It was cool. Um, I got to ask, and I, I don't even know if I've told you this, Justin. I meant to text you this. Uh, the only person um, that I got to ask for an autograph uh, was the chick that played Sam. And Melissa Barrera. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, Didn't she turn you down? Yeah, yeah. I okay, you I, okay good. Did she say no? no. She, she, was, she was nice, though. <laughs> she was like, because, like, dude, again, it was, like, COVID-19 shit and, like, they probably had strict, like, filming protocol that's like, hey, like, don't interact with the townies because we don't want you to get the fucking, the Rona. Dude, just watch. In two months, she's going to be announced for Monster Mania or fucking one other convention. I guarantee Well, you. I hope she gets announced for uh, enrolling into an acting school. That'd be... Oh, that'd be, that'd be, my. That'd be God. first thing that I hope. Ladies and gentlemen, we haven't even gotten there. God damn it. <laughs> so, Jeremy, we, even, we, haven't, we haven't even done the promo. So I, uh, yet, I, son of a bitch. I asked her, I said, uh, you know, we said, hey, would, would you mind signing an autograph? And she was, she was very nice. She goes, um, no, thank you. We were like, okay, cool. Have a good day. Thank you. Looking forward to the movie. You know, so she was the only one that we got to ask for an autograph. And not every swing is a home run, ladies and gentlemen. Strike out. I mean, I just don't understand if, like, if there were filming protocols, why you wouldn't be like, I, you know, I would love to, but I can't. Like, why you would say no anyway? Like, you know, you're a part of this giant franchise. What do exactly. You think the horror fans yeah. are going to do. They're going to want your autograph from now on. It doesn't matter what you do. You could be super famous down the line. And here we go. We're coming up in our <laughs> tattoos and our black t-shirts. And we're like, can we have your autograph on this screen poster? One, <laughs> dude, she was probably at happen. Chipotle yesterday buying her lunch. And someone walked up and was like, that new scream. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's going to be around every single corner. And I think yeah. that's something that they should be very aware of. I mean, franchise heavy stuff. You're going to have a buttload of fans no matter where you go, no matter what you do. Yeah. It would have been really nice if she was just like, it, I, I, if I were her, I mean, if I was someone that was an up and coming actor in a movie oh, this big, yeah. I'd be like, fuck yeah, man, I'll sign all your yeah, stuff. Totally. Like I would feel honored to be a part of this and also that people wanted my autograph. I mean, she is the yeah. new lead character. She's basically our new Sydney, um, which we'll get Oof. into in a few Oof. minutes, but that's. Let, Jeremy, I can see it. I can Woof. see it. I can see it in your eyes. God damn it. <laughs> There's a spoiler to our spoilers we're going to give but real quick before we actually get into our initial thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a quick promo break. And when we come back, we are going to get in deep into the fucking wound of Scream. We will be right back. Hi, this is Mikey. And this is Maddie. And we are the Alone in the Dark podcast. Join us on this nostalgic journey through horror where you will find top five theme podcasts and audio commentaries curated for some of your favorite horror films. If you're into celebrating the best films that came out during a certain year, then you'll really dig our class of episodes. We even repurpose lines from your favorite horror movies to create a brand new story for our special In the World of Podcasts. We bring you something different each and every episode, so let us be your video store curators. Fun is guaranteed, and there are never any late fees. Remember... You're never really alone in the dark. And we are back. Creeps! Yes. In our new Fresh Frights review of the brand new Scream movie. And we've all been sitting on this for so long. We can't wait to let it out of the vault. Our initial thoughts on the newest installment in one of the most iconic horror franchises of all time. So... We're going to start with our guest, Deandra. What were your initial thoughts? We know there's so many people waiting to hear this on Scream. Well, I went in super excited. I've been so excited for a long time. I saw Scream 4 when it came out in 2011 at the midnight premiere when they were still doing those. And I just love the heck out of it. I mean, after the first one, honestly, Scream 4 is my favorite. And I don't know if it has to do with kind of that nostalgia factor um, and, and being able to see it in the theater. But I just loved it. And I thought it was so timely. In fact, it's more timely today. Um, I really liked the opening to this. Could really get those callbacks. Um, but as the film went on, it just... It was well shot, but I just didn't care for it that much. I was super disappointed. Um, now, Melissa, who played Sam, and uh, Jenna, who was in so much stuff, who played Tara, they have done a fantastic job. And it was a nice switch up that the opening kill, quote unquote, was actually not a kill. It was an attempted kill. And 
I really also liked, um, oh gosh, uh, Jasmine, who played uh, Mindy, um, Randy's niece. Um, but I just felt like it was a little too CW. Um, the, the, the legacy characters, when they were introduced, uh, they were just kind of like, it felt unnecessary. The CGI for Skeet as Billy was terrible, honestly. I felt like he looked like a 40-year-old shaven dude. Um, and that's I, like me. He, that's me. He just did. I mean, he didn't. He. Di- I mean, it's not that he looked old. He just didn't look young. Um, he didn't look like a teenager. They like put that like um, inst- and, they put that like Instagram filter on him. Yeah, I was like, and he kept coming back, and I was like, why? And through the whole movie, and I don't know if we're gonna talk about this later. Maybe we will. But this was like the biggest thing for me, is um. So we get the the whole motive of the killers, and it's like toxic fandom, and we're going to make our own movie. And I was like, I just don't feel like that's enough of a motivation for me to go out and, like, kill. You're going to kill Dewey when you, like, really like the Stab movies. And he's, like, an integral character in 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 kind of that, that whole universe and helped create it. And you're going to go out and you're going to kill Sam because... Cause why? Like it, I can see it, but like not really at the same time, like you should kind of be a fan. I don't know why you'd kill the thing that you're a fan of, but people do it all the time. It just didn't seem like enough of motivation. And throughout the entire movie, we've got Billy. We've got people saying, you know, oh, it was Billy and his friend. It was Billy and this. It was Billy. It was two killers, but Billy. Everybody talks about Billy. I was like, gosh, darn it. They've got to be Where's like, Stu? these killers are super, <laughs> yeah, into Stu. Like they've, they probably are like, it's time for Stu's turn. You know, maybe... Maybe they really like Stu. Maybe they want the remake. Maybe they, they want to kind of both be equals this time, whatever it is. And then there's like, no Stu. And I'm like, I feel like I had blue balls from it because there that just felt like such an important part of the plot that would have really tied it all together with a nice bow. And we just didn't get that. Instead, it was just some crazy fans, which the girl was too much for me. (laughs) Um, And the fact that she ended up killing Dewey, it's like she was really going hard on this like adult man. How how do you put in your heart? You can't do it. It's not physically possible for you. The guy, yes. The girl, no. See, listen, Um, I I love that. That's one point that we'll have to flesh out because I actually debated on whether or not to bring that up because I didn't want to be concerned considered like an asshole you know uh, fucking misogynist fucking whatever toxic masculine guy or whatever but yeah. uh, there are some things that need to be discussed with that for sure yeah. I and think. like when and 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 it was the same sort of thing for me and watching even though i love scream for when emma roberts comes down like you get ghost face and he's like i'm ghost face and then all of a sudden she comes down and she's like really really tiny and she takes off the mask and you're like oh my god i had no idea like dude she's like three feet tall it's this magic pill they must no be idea. taking yeah, yeah they must what take she this wear magic pill where they, shoes? They, they grow to like fucking six foot tall and they're like you know they have the strength of a 250 pound it's like guy. power rangers um, turbo yeah. when the blue ranger was like a 12 year old little boy <laughs> but then when he morphed he was a six foot tall man it's just like that and yes, I used yeah. a Power Ranger reference. And I, <laughs> I love it. But yeah, I mean, I, I want to see it again because maybe my opinion will change. But I just walked out of there disappointed. And I see people talk about how much they love it. And I just love Scream. I mean, after Nightmare, it's my favorite. Um, but it just kind of fell flat to me. And just the addition of, of Sydney and Gail. I mean, they had some nice points. And I get it. They're, they're trying to pass the torch, which is actually one of the the, the um, t- tracks um, on the in the score. Um, but it just, even though the two main female girls gave amazing performances, I, I just felt like there was some predictability. There just needed to be more to the motive as well, because I mean, toxic fandom is a thing. It's definitely something to talk about, but I feel like there's more in horror culture that's more relevant. And as far as what maybe scream could get at because they always commented on the stuff it just felt like it wasn't enough and if you're going to talk about um you know like tara likes elevated horror like the baba duke and whatnot and um there's never really any like debate between the potential killers or more people about you know what's the great part of slashers versus like elevated horror and it just felt like you came out and you're like just bring it back to the roots man i'm telling you that it just was kind of missing some of those points for me 
So that's that's my review in a nutshell. That your initial thoughts and Jeremy, you and I watched this movie last week, and I'm not going to tell our listeners yet until I get to sure. mine how I walked away from it upon my first initial <laughs> viewing. But you, I remember how you felt. Now you got to see it a second time yeah. as yeah, well. Yeah. I've seen it three times. So You've seen it what thrice are now, times. Three times, baby. What are now your initial thoughts on the movie? Um, so when we were in the theater, Justin, we were literally fist bumping, high fiving. I mean, that first scene was like, holy fuck. I mean, they they upped the violence and brutality factor big time. Mm-hmm. You know, we got some some glimpses of that in the Wes Craven films. You know, of course, like in the beginning of the original Scream, you know, Drew Barrymore's guts was hanging out. Her boyfriend, Steve's guts were hanging out like that. That is one hell of a brutal way to start a film. Um, but oh, a lot of the sequels were, were the kills were done kind of tastefully. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't just that really mean spirited kill from Ghostface. You know, he kind of went in and did his thing. This Ghostface and this interpretation off the bat, brutal as fuck. I mean, just unrelenting like stabbing, I mean, stomping down on Tara's ankle and snapping her ankle. And just the way that it was shot, the visual style from Radio Silence to Wes Craven, there was a clear distinction between the two. Um, and I, Justin, I know that, <laughs> I know that you're going to talk a lot about that uh, directing style, but I, I loved it. I was like, fuck, this is called Scream, much like the 1996 original, but like this very opening feels familiar and very different at the same time. I was captivated. I was like, I was very excited. I was like, oh shit, that was amazing. And then we find out that like, like Deandre said, Tara doesn't die. This is the first time in a scream film where the, you know, ever, ever where yeah. the first kill wasn't an actual kill. It was an attempted kill or, you know, maybe an attempted kill, you know, cause you find out that the killers kind of knew what they were doing. They stayed away from the major organs and stuff. Uh, to make sure she lived, right? So, I thought that was fucking amazing. So then the second act hits, right? So it's introducing the characters, and I really, I felt like the character development in this film was was very paper thin, right? Like with the original mm-hmm. Scream, and I, it's unfortunate we have to compare it to the original Scream because it is. Well, we have we have the original, and we have you know three other sure. movies we have it to compare sure, it to absolutely because well, it is the fifth it is, film is in the a series. fifth film in continuity. It is not a remake. It's again. It's called. It is a requel. It is a requel. It is a requel, as Mindy says. It is. Mm-hmm. It is called Scream. You know? So of course I'm going to compare it back to the original. Like, dude, Wes Craven, Kevin Williamson's 1996 Scream really took the time for us to get to know Sydney. She is a fully developed character, right? We know that you know she lives with her dad. Her, her dad is widowed because her mom was viciously murdered a year before that. Um, she's got a lot of issues with that. She has trust issues with that. We know that Gail Weathers, this reporter, wrote a book about how the person who was convicted for killing her mother was actually innocent. And in the book, Gail Weathers calls Sydney a fucking liar, right? So there's that dynamic right there. She has this grudge against this reporter. You know, she's got this boyfriend that... You know, he wants to take their relationship intimately to the next level. You know, you get to meet her her core friend group. You get to know Tatum is her best friend. Tatum is her ride or die. Like, Tatum has her back, right? There's all of these these layers for this character that by the time the shit starts hitting the fan, by the time that Ghostface starts going after Sidney Prescott, we're invested in her. I feel like that time was not developed for any character in this new film. Like, I feel like it was your stereotypical horror, paper-thin, cardboard cutout characters, right? So they give us Tara, and it's like, okay, she's the daughter of Billy Loomis. None of that was really explained. We don't need everything spelled out for us. That's fine. Um, She moved away when she was 18. She left her sister behind. She left her mom behind um, because she found out that she was the daughter of Billy Loomis. Um, She's dating this, this guy, Richie, that she's been dating him for like six months. Sister gets killed. She goes back to Woodsboro. She has visions of her dead well, dad. Well, sister doesn't get. I mean, killed, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Her sister get attacked. Gets, gets attacked. Brutally yeah, attacked. As you just yeah, said. That, yeah, that's, just what said. I mean. <laughs> that's what I meant. That's what I meant. But hey, man, we're, we're so used to seeing them get killed. Yeah. So, so like no. you know, yeah. so 
she goes back to Woodsboro and she sees visions of her dead father that she's never met, but she's, I'm sure, seen news articles and things like that to where, sure, I guess it makes sense that she would know what he looks like, you know, whatever. That's it. That's it. I don't know anything about this character at all. Like, I don't relate to her. I'm not rooting for her. She's just a character that I'm I'm given mm-hmm. basic things that I'm supposed to follow along. Um, the legacy, I'm just going to jump into it. The legacy characters, man. Um, Dewey makes sense. Dewey feels organic to the story, right? Dewey stayed in Woodsboro. He used to be the sheriff. You find out that his story has taken a dramatic turn. Him and Gail are now divorced. You find out why. Um, his drinking got out of control. They asked him to retire. He now lives in a trailer. He's miserable. He still watches Gail Weathers on TV every day. He still loves her. He feels like he failed. He feels organic to the story, and it makes sense that he would want to show up because he feels like a coward for how he ran away from his marriage, so he would want to do something heroic, which is, that brings us to, you know, the hospital scene with him. That was his motivation, is he didn't want to be a coward. So, all of that stuff, I like it. My wish is that, I wish that the only cameos we got of Gail Weathers and Sidney Prescott was when uh, when Gail was on TV and Dewey was watching her. I wish that was all we got of her because I feel like that would have been fine. And he texts her, Ghostface is back, don't come here. I, I'm i sure Courtney would have loved the $1.5 million she got paid for this movie just to sure. do that. But I'm sure they were like, mm-hmm. you need to do a little bit more yeah, than that. Yeah, so I wish that was her only cameo. And Sydney, when she was jogging with, you know, the baby carriage, like, I wish that was her only cameo. I'm Sydney Prescott. Of course I have a fucking gun. It does not make sense that Sydney Prescott would leave wherever she lives with two kids and a husband to go where there's a mass serial killer where she's already had, you know, four run-ins with other psychopathic serial killers. It makes no sense that she would get on a plane and be like, you know where the fuck I'm going? Right to where all these murders are happening and this person's going to want to kill me? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I understand that that we're talking about a horror film and we have to suspend some belief in things, but... If my wife, who had endured everything Sidney Prescott did, was like, "Hey, honey, I'm buying. You're gonna have to watch the kids." Well, if you're if you're Patrick Dempsey, yeah, exactly, because she. Mm-hmm. If, if you're if you're Mark and you, Cade, you find out that Sidney did marry Mark and Cade from Scream Three. So like, no, dude, he's he's an ex cop. Yeah. So all of a sudden, yeah. it's like, "Hey, honey, I'm gonna need you to watch the kids, um, because I'm getting on a plane and going to Woodsboro, where there's another, you know, vicious." serial killer slayings that are happening and I got to go there and he's just like you know what honey I feel like that's a that's a wise decision I feel like you got to do that like come on she would never go there she would never go there so I it doesn't make sense collectively I would say they probably have 12 minutes of screen time total um for yeah. Gail and and Sydney I'd say 12 minutes tops 25 you think so yeah I, I was I saw it three times I I don't trust your your I don't trust your time Time judgment. I saw it stone cold sober the last two times. Well, did you have a stopwatch in the theater? The, like, hop, hop, the, the Sydney's time. there, dude. Dude, it, it's it, dude. It's called a it's called a, it's called a smart watch. Okay, so you know? when um, I do watch this eventually again, I'm gonna prove you wrong. They probably have about 12 minutes of screen time. It's 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 not 12 minutes. It's not 12 minutes. <laughs> um, I guarantee you. Yeah, 12 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> so I just I don't know. Like, it just feels like they were wasted. And then here's these characters that, that Wes Craven intentionally had survived four films. Dewey could have been the Dr. Loomis of the Scream franchise, right? He has a total investment in stopping these ghost-faced psychopaths, right? His sister got murdered from Ghostface. Uh, you know, um, all of these other people around him have been murdered by Ghostface. You know, like, he has an investment to where he'd be like, you know... I feel like I owe it to my sister to continually try to stop these crazy people. He he makes sense. You should have him in every fucking mm-hmm. Scream movie that takes place in Woodsboro. Mm-hmm. And even when it doesn't take place in Woodsboro, fucking Dewey should be there like Dr. Loomis. Like, I fucking shot him and blah, blah, blah. Give me <laughs> give me crazy Dewey that is hunting down these ghost face killers, man. That's what I want. Um, instead, they fucking off him. It was a brutal way to go. And... We're talking about a slasher franchise. Eventually, people people die. They did it to Nancy Thompson, R.I.P. I know. I know. Still sensitive. Hey, hey, at least they, they did Dewey with some justice. 
Just gonna say it that way. Um, sh- I got to pop in here. I got to. They, they should have killed Gail. They should have killed Gail. But before, before, before we go too far, too far deep. I got, I got one more. I got one more. Th- I got one more thing. Yeah. We'll keep. We'll, we'll we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to okay. it. We'll get to it. Because we're gonna dissect the movie. This is just initial thoughts, Jeremy. You don't need to blow your wad yet. I'm blowing my it, dude. You, Sorry, no, I no, my wad. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. That's what initial thoughts are for. Just a bre- I get it. We're all excited, but so. <laughs> I came out of this thing watching it from the first time not being a huge fan of this movie. I had way more issues with it than I expected to have. And I think it was the Halloween kill syndrome simply because we've finally gotten used to what disappointment feels like with these movies. Now, in terms of the legacy characters, I understand this on the basis it's a Hollywood movie. There's no possible way, Jeremy, that we would get quote unquote cameos of these characters. They need to be in the movie in order for it to work for every audience member. Not just the new people, but the old school fans. And they should have they should have written a better script then. This I, I think the script is actually fantastic. So I'm gonna come out on a limb here and say I disagree with a lot of what both of you said. I agree with what some of you said. Um, but I think that it was actually a very smartly written script. I think including the legacy characters, they absolutely have to do that. That's not a choice. That's a given. You, you They even say the line, you can't have Halloween without Jamie Lee. And it's on the nose. Jamie Lee was integral to, to Halloween 2018. It need, These it characters needs to be were not. there, though. That's true. But it's different because how many times have we had Jamie Lee in a movie? 2018 was a completely different thing where the movie is solely based on that character. This movie's idea is that we've already had a ton of other movies with legacy characters. Sidney Prescott has been the center of how many movies? Four, right? Mm -hmm. So we've already seen them attempt the same thing in, in Scream 4. We already saw this where, I mean, Scream 4, Sidney is wasting scream time making tea and standing in a kitchen there's no way in that movie that she would go back to woodsboro for a book tour but guess what it's a fucking movie and she's gonna do that because the story requires it in order for the plot to be driven forward so it's the same thing here where imagine this movie coming out you want to talk about toxic fandom and not having sydney prescott she's not dead right Mm mm-hmm Dewey's not dead. Gail Weathers is not dead in this storyline because it is a requel. Imagine just having those cameos and seeing fans, how furious they would be. I get it because one of my main issues with this movie was how they were treated, not Dewey. Dewey is beautiful in this movie. It's one of the most powerful things in the entire series, I, I let alone this movie. Let alone this movie. David Arquette's best performance as the character in this movie. Yeah. But, that's just the reality of how these things work. So my mind is very practical in terms of Hollywood and what they're requiring it to be like, well, we're going to do this movie, but you have to have check off these boxes. I mean, we actually have by the book paint by numbers, the Han Solo scene with Ray and Finn from the force awakens in this movie. When Sam goes to Dewey's trailer to, to beg him out to help. It's the same scene. The dialogue's different. It's the same thing. So I'm I'm disagreeing. Um, I'm disagreeing what, with you because no, it's okay. I'm, I'm still in my initial yeah. thoughts. I'm still in my initial thoughts. Because Jerry. okay, look, um, Halloween 2018. Okay, well, I'm comparing the two. Okay. Yes, J- can, Jamie, though, Jamie how, Lee was integral times, to the script, but yet they still introduced new characters to carry the franchise on. I care about Allison. You know the other characters that are involved. They're great characters. I I was along for the ride with them. This one, I liked a lot of the characters in this movie. Actually, yeah. a lot of them. Our main characters, we have to get to. We're gonna we're gonna dissect Understood. this thing through and Understood. throughout. But I think the majority of the characters are fantastic. Actually, I think they're better written than a lot of the side characters you've gotten through this whole series. Look at Scream Two. Look at Scream Three. Look at Scream Four. A lot of those side characters are so forgettable you won't remember their names after you see them die. But in this movie. I remembered each one of their names. They're distinctly connected to the storyline of the original movie through family, which is such a huge thing in horror. Like, family means so much in these movies, especially in Scream. 
So family. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that that's an integral part of what these movies are. And I'm glad that we see new characters that are connected to it directly living in this town. It feels organic to me. The writing feels organic. I think that there are a lot of things to discuss in this movie. You'll get your chance to argue with me for well, sure. I'm going mean, to argue with you works. the whole way. <laughs> not everything works. Not everything works. Believe me. But personally, here's my the end of my initial thoughts because I'll blab forever. I think after Scream 2, this is the best sequel of the entire series. You said after Scream 2? After okay. Scream 2, the best sequel. I love Scream 4, but I made sure to do my job right and watch through all of the movies again after I saw this again for a second time, just to make sure, because I, again, these rankings can go up and down and I'm sure Jeremy in a few weeks, we will be doing a ranking episode because it absolutely has to happen. I mean, there's, there's no way around it. We don't want to spoil that for this episode, but no, I mean, nothing's ever going to touch Scream yeah. 2. Let's let's face it. I, I'm, I'm always going to be stuck in that. And like, as Deandra said earlier on, there's a nostalgia that goes with the first Scream you ever saw in a theater. Um, but also, it's just like the best second movie in a horror franchise ever. Just, just saying. But opening it up, though, you, you guys both touched on it. That first opening scene, it, I felt like it was very powerful, very mean-spirited, very like... It, it's a great throwback to the original... Roger Jackson's there in full force as Ghostface. He just sounds perfect. I think the dialogue is so witty. And I just, I loved the opening scene. Yeah, I, I loved it too. Cause we really got a taste of it. And I know when I went in with uh, my significant other, he's not a huge fan, but he was like, yeah, I feel like it was kind of like Halloween kills. Like, why is it so brutal? I was like, well, you know, it's a, it's a different age, but at the same time, it's, 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 kind of necessary and it makes in my humble opinion the movie all the more suspenseful and you just get kind of the threat level of the the killer in these particular films and and Ghostface has kind of been a little bit silly especially I mean of course we had four and three oh god Roman was just such a goofy (laughs) Ghostface um but I just love the force of it and, and the callbacks and the acting by Jenna is just phenomenal. It's so phenomenal. And that we gotta house give is her, so interesting. Yeah, definitely. We got to give her props. I think, I mean, I have to say, and Jeremy, you remember me saying this after in the car, after on the way home from seeing it, I was like, <laughs> I was making fun of the little bit of overacting that she does in that scene. But to be, to be completely honest, after watching this movie a few times, she's the most realistic of any victim of any of these movies ever. She legitimately personifies what it would feel like to be a person home alone in their house. They have this technology being able to lock their doors and they're still not safe. You know what I mean? Like how that would feel to be a teenage girl. Your mom's not there. There's no, you know, sister, brother. There's no parent there. You're alone. Not even, there's no dog or anything either. So you're literally there by yourself. And, and that's why the suspension of disbelief worked for me because there's a lot of, you know, you could just put, hang the phone up. And when she calls nine, where well, you see on the, the, the app, you know, police have been informed or whatever. They've been contacted. You're like, I would just go upstairs and run in a bedroom and lock the fucking door. But this girl's already been like terrified by this. She's already connected to this. So she's going to stick with it. And that's why it works so, so well. I think, I mean, honestly, other than the first two screen movies, I think this is the most impressive opening. I just love how somber it is, how cold it is. It's also, you know, we've seen hand stabs in, in screen mm-hmm. before, but there's never been anything shot and portrayed as brutally as this is in terms of the sequels. I think it, in terms of an opening attack, it's just, Oh, you feel it. It's so visceral. I loved that Roger Jackson in the beginning of, of the first scene, starts off with a more basic, normal, non-menacing sounding voice. Yeah, we've, right? We've never gotten mm-hmm. that before to where he pretends to be someone from her mom's, like, AA. Her, her yeah, group, Her group yeah. or whatever. Um, I thought that was really cool, really creative, because I was like, oh, shit, like, like maybe Ghostface is going to call next. And then it quickly, you know, you discover, like, oh, no, this is fucking Ghostface putting on a normal, normal voice. I really, I really dug that. And Jenna Ortega's performance in this, like, I think that she was the most likable person of the new cast in in my opinion I agree. and I honestly I think that this movie has made so much money already 
we're getting a sequel. Fifty three point nine million on a twenty four million dollar budget. It's already destroyed Scream 4's box office. Its entire box office in only one week. We're definitely getting a sequel. You know, they've positioned Sam and Tara to be, you know, to carry the torch from this. My opinion, right? Because my my fandom mind and brain goes is that Tara is going to transition into being the lead in this franchise. And I my, hope so. my, I hope so. My too. thought and my theory is, you know, we already have a person that was a hero in this one that had, you know, viciously attacked somebody at the end of the movie to protect herself and is already seeing, you know, like a la psycho psycho visions of her dead father. My thought is eventually we're going to get a scream where it's going to be the okie doke where it, it might be scream six or scream seven where all of a sudden Sam is the killer and Tara is the lead and she's going after her sister. Well, here's the interesting thing. And mm-hmm. I, I think I need to, to mention this right off the bat is that the scream co-writer James Vanderbilt revealed recently that the film wasn't meant to kickstart a new trilogy at all. It was envisioned as a complete movie in its own right. The actual quote was Coming into this, they looked at it as, if we have to make one screen movie, what would we put into it to make it a one-shot? And, and to do that, to make it like Wes's films, it need to be a full meal from beginning to the end. So it's interesting that they, they approached it that way, whereas, you know, with the new Halloween movies, David Gordon Green and Danny McBride always envisioned it as a new trilogy. Also, the question I have for both of you right now, because we know that these actors go in to audition for a role right and sometimes they'll say Mm -hmm. well we think you're better for this role it may be different than the role they're going in for can you imagine the movie had jenna ortega played sam instead of tara and it was switched because i feel like the movie would be completely different the dynamic would be a totally different thing because i get it jeremy i i see the hate i understand like that's one of the things right now not just in screen fandom, but in horror fandom, people, I mean, you're either on one side or the other, whether you like Melissa Barrera's Sam Carpenter or you don't, there is no substitute for Sidney Prescott. Let's make that clear. And it's extremely difficult. They went on a, on a limb on this movie, mm-hmm. whereas Halloween 2018, it was still Lori's story and they were able to achieve a movie that, presented her as the centerpiece with introducing new characters where this movie literally tried to just shove a new character. It's the Terminator dark fate syndrome, which we already experienced where they tried to just, here's this new character. She's next to Sarah Connor, but you have to, we're trying to force you to like her. Yeah. And I think the writing's Mm -hmm. there, the writing's on the wall. The character is there. Um, I just, honestly, I wish the two actors were switched and I think the whole movie would have worked. I mean, the thing about Tara's character and Jenna Ortega, she's so vulnerable and yet so strong at the same time later on in the movie. But Sam never has, I mean, she, she never really goes up and down in terms of emotion. She, she tries to, but there's always this boldness to her character that doesn't, it doesn't let you win. Whereas Sydney Prescott, as you guys said, Mm -hmm. I mean, she's vulnerable. She's real. She's likable, but yet she's bad fucking ass in the first scream. Mm -hmm. I mean, she doesn't give a shit. She also doesn't like horror movies. There's there's something about that character, and they're trying to piggyback off that and create a brand new character. It, it It's such a fine line of where to go with it. Either you're going to hit or you're going to miss. And I think here, for most fans, it's a hit, but here we have to talk about it. I just, Deandra, I mean, I'm sure you could comment on this. I, uh, what didn't what what didn't work about her character? Because I think there's so many things that you know. I think you're right about the fact that she's kind of bold, but at the same time, it's because it, it is such a, a a kind of a difference between Sydney because she does have those ups and downs, and she comes off as a timid character, but she has like moments like he forgot one thing about Billy Loomis, I fucking killed him, like all of that stuff. Um, and, and, and she is, uh, you know, you already know she's a troublemaker, so she's, she's just going to come out the gate and be kind of a badass. Um, the dynamic didn't really affect me as much. It just, and, and I, I'm a huge advocate for kind of shaking up the final girl a little bit, like having somebody who is a hoe or who's, who's bold or somebody who's goth or whatever it might be, um, 
it, it make it different. It just, I think my issues were not necessarily so much with her execution because I thought she did a really, really good job and she was that protector of her sister. I mean, that was really what drove her the whole time was to make sure that her sister was okay. I think for me, it was just some of the other plot elements that made me uncomfortable. And and I think maybe I, I can't deny my bias of, you know, Sydney's not in the spotlight. And so I think there's just kind of that inherent, like getting used to it sort of thing. Um, and I don't I just feel like like Jeremy had touched upon that we just didn't get deeper into her story as well. So it just kind of felt like she was out there. She was bold. But um, I just I needed more from her as a main character as far as a uh, story goes. I needed to know more. But that, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. I, I think that's that fine line between the fact that in the original scream, we had that time, that opportunity. This is a new thing to give that, that character representation and development. Whereas now, Jeremy, we know here's the runtime. Here's what we have to fit into this runtime. That's just how Hollywood works. And unfortunately that's just what they're going to shove into audiences faces is like, we have to have this many new characters. We have to have this many kills. We have to have, that's just the way it works. And unfortunately, like the movie suffers for that. But I think there are so many great things about this movie to celebrate. I just, I mean, again, thinking about the tone and how they really went for something different in terms of like how mean it was. Dude, the kills, the kills were fucking fantastic. Dude. Absolutely fantastic. To you, you know, in the bar scene, which by the way, why, why the fuck are a bunch of high school kids at a bar? They're, they're mm-hmm. drinking. I saw some, one of them drinking a beer. I'm like, wait, in Woodsboro, you can drink beer at like you're 17. You're, you're a senior. Yeah. Whatever. I've already been through enough. But, but we have we have this dude, Vince, show up who has a Jason tattoo. No one fucking noticed this but me. I'm like, because I have a Jason tattoo that. on the back of yeah. my arm. And I was like, Jason tattoo right here on the forearm. And apparently he was, t- correct me if I'm wrong, the actor was in the Nightmare remake or yeah, something. Yeah. He I, was. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so. I mean, he's a total douche. And I was like, but that I'm like, but he's like pissing on the wall. I'm like, that's me hammered. Dude, like, and the right fact now. when he went, when, <laughs> when he yelled to himself, fuck it. When he was pissing, dude, we've all been that drunk uh, before. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure that during the movie, I repeated that and you were like, shut the fuck up. Dude. We're gonna get kicked out of here. <laughs> I gotta be honest. His, his scene and bringing back red right hand, which screen oh, four, that is one of my quarrels. You had to, it. right? You had to bring back that Nick Cave. Whole love it. Scene love it. With, with the, the brutality and the light of the, the car. And then just the way that the rain's like drizzling. That, yeah. I, it, it, it is one of my favorite scenes in that entire and he, movie. He and plays, I was looking, I was like, oh he plays God, Stu Mocker's God. nephew. He's yeah, yeah he's his yeah. nephew. He's Stu's nephew. He is the son of Stu's sister. sister. Yeah. That's what they said. Mm-hmm. I love I love that scene because we had never seen a kill like this ever before in a screen. One movie jab. Where Ghostface just walks up nonchalantly and just goes like it's a quick yeah. jab to the neck. It's like, and I was like, yeah. oh my god, I love that. It's, I love that. It's it was yeah. beautiful and it felt so much like Scream. And then that was the first time we saw in the movie. There's only two times you see in the movie the knife swipe. The glove yeah. swipe, mm-hmm. with the, and you see him. It, yeah, love it's, that. It's beautiful. It's brilliant, and and this just follows after a great scene of dialogue from these new characters. That's why I can't agree that these new characters Dude. aren't good because their dialogue is so snappy. It feels just like the original. I think there's so much nostalgia attached to the original movie that these new characters, of course, they're never going. I mean, that that was my problem. They're never going to live up to how attached we are to that core group of characters from the original. But I think for the most part, I think the characters in this movie are more memorable. Again, I'm going to keep pounding this in like a knife to the fucking chest, you know, more than the the new characters and even scream four or, or scream three. I think, I, mean, I think just, one of my biggest frustrations, you like real kids. I think one of my biggest frustrations mm-hmm. is that this movie was almost a home run for me. I, I liked the first act. I liked the second act. I was willing to forgive a lot of your stereotypical paper thin horror, you know, sub characters. I was fine with that because the kills were great. The atmosphere was great. I was I was really yeah. enjoying the new 
direction that the the film was 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 going in. And then, you know, when the legacy characters got shoehorned in and then all of a sudden we were I felt like out of nowhere we were at the finale. You know, we're at Stu Mocker's fucking house. We're at the fucking location that the original scream ended, right? We're at Stu Mocker's house and I feel like they underutilized that. Like this this yeah. should have been a fucking event with not nece- you don't necessarily have to do the callbacks, but if you're going to to take the time to write in your script that the movie ends at Stu Mocker's house, th- there should have been way way more things that upped the importance of that, right? Like you know, uh, yeah. between the outside shots from the original with with Sydney and the inside, you know, they hardly showed anything upstairs. You know, they didn't even go in the fucking garage. You know, that basement scene should have been the. They garage. They went in the basement instead. Yeah, I, I said yeah, the same. It, it was definitely why. Why that, wasn't that it? had to why have been a, like a budgetary thing? But like my thing was like, okay, so now all of a sudden I felt like we were suddenly in the finale, and then it's like you're in Stu Mocker's house, and then that was like kind of it. Like and like like DeAndre, like you were saying. We've got these Billy flashbacks, and they've talked about Stu several times. We end up at his house, and it just felt like, yeah. to me, it felt anticlimactic. Like, I just I just felt like, boom, 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 okay, here's yeah. the killers. There's the twist that they had to write in for who the killers are. We were at the end of the movie. Like, it just, to me, was like, it was almost a home run. Almost. You guys, yeah. seriously, the fact that they, they started the scene at the Mocker house. I mean, Amber lives there, right? We have no indication that she lives there. The first shot when they're in the house, we know they're there. Yeah. So who who are they trying to surprise or shock by yeah. this? Why did they not just do a classic? Because they already did it twice in the movie, a classic Craven Crane shot. Yep. Yeah. They did it at the high school. They did it yep. one other place in the movie. I can't remember. Just like the original, just do it. Let us know we're there. Then yeah. the audience is already invested. Oh my God, they're at the Mocker house. So th- we know it was a set. Yeah. It's not the yeah. house. We know that, but they, like, it's identical. Um, I just don't understand what they were like. What mystery is there to exactly. to, 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 to hold back on the house? We all yeah, know it's not, the fucking house. We can tell it's yeah, the you house. You see the stairs. You see the the. They I mean the whole layout. The kitchen, it's, it's just unmistakable. The, and the other thing that really bothered me is, it's like we're at the Mocker house. Like all these kids are connected, and we're in the middle of this this big murder murder spree and it's right like, yeah and it's like it's like we're Let's at the mocker, the mocker house, house and nobody's yeah. like dude we're at the mocker house this like, is how the is same this thing not a coincidence i was saying last night i was saying i was like this would be considered like the equivalent of the myers house yeah. you know you yeah. wouldn't go to that house if again wes just died wes hicks just died I mean, I, I love I love the on the nose, you know, the banner in the background that says for West. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I do love it that it's like a celebration. Kids are dumb. Sure. I got one of them in there. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. When, when you're that age, I'm still that age, actually. What the fuck am I? <laughs> you, 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 you're not thinking things through. You're like you're, you're celebrating. You're just living life or whatever. But still at the same time. On a technical level, yes, it's a horror movie, but yeah, you would really go to that house in the yeah, middle of fun. nowhere when people are getting slaughtered your age? No, it wouldn't happen. Another another but, beef that I have. So there's the scene where they're all sitting in in Randy's uh, sister's house, right? And, and Martha Meeks. Martha Meeks. And yeah. then they're they're going across the room, and they're like, "Okay, well, she is the daughter of Billy Loomis," and they they're going across like saying what every connection was. You know, okay, you're related to Randy. You know, Randy's niece and nephew, right? So you mean to tell me that nobody in that room would have gone, oh, and you live in Stu Mocker's house. Like, why wasn't that brought up? That's very yeah. much a connection to the original killings, which was the purpose of that. Well, scene. I think I, I understand what, what what you're saying, and it's definitely in connection to what I brought up. But at the same time, I think that they were really trying to make it a surprise. But what I'm trying to say nicely is the surprise failed miserably. It it makes no sense because we all saw the fucking set picks. It was Mm -hmm. Kevin Williamson, the new directors and whoever was, you know, the stunt guy was in the ghost face costume during that night in front of the set. And you could tell it was a set. So you knew they were going to shoot in the house. So why they thought it would be like this millennium Falcon moment (laughs) again. And they, and they, again, they reference they reference the fact that this is like that in the movie, so I have to give them credit because it's so on the nose. They know what I'm, they're doing. I'm, they know what I'm they're so doing. I'm so thankful that you just said a Millennium 
Falcon moment because that is my segue to bring up another point that I have is that this film was like they were sitting next to the Star Wars sequel trilogy in class and they were like, fuck, I didn't study for the test. And all of a sudden they're looking over at the Star Wars sequel trilogy's paper copying the test, right? This this movie has so many key points that was like, fuck, that's the Star Wars sequel trilogy right there, right? So, okay, so Rey was the star of the new sequel trilogy, right? Guess who her dad was? Yeah. The Emperor, the central villain from the original trilogy. Oh, we, uh, you can't even, you can't Dude, quote that, 100%, 100%. Though. You can't quote the rise of Skywalker. 100%. That's not even fair 100%. because that was done after no, the no, no, fact. No, 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 100%, 100%, no. absolutely. No. Okay, um, so... Dewey dies, no, like you said. God. Dewey dies the same exact way. He's the way. Han Solo the Han moment. Han Solo moment. Okay, so here, here's another. Here's another mm-hmm. one. Ready for this? There is a scene in Scream Four where Judy Hicks corners Sydney in a dark hallway, and there's an ominous scene where she goes, "We went to school together. You, you didn't remember me, but we we sat next to each other in this class." And and that's why you and, fucking thought that she had had sex with Billy 100%, Loomis. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So, so yeah. there's this whole ominous scene in Scream Four where she's like, "You don't remember me." Right, and it was like you could tell that Wes was setting something up, uh, or Kevin was setting something up uh-huh. for a future sequel. Right, so that was very much that moment in Scream Four was very much the moment in the Star Wars sequel trilogy where Ray hands Luke Skywalker the lightsaber at the end. And what does Ryan Johnson do? And Ryan Johnson is heavily mentioned in this film, by the way. Well, Hold on. he's referenced. No, 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 yeah. he is. He is. They 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 mention him. Oh, the Knives Out guy directed it. Yeah, that's it sucks. That's why you don't exactly. you don't have good taste in movies or whatever. <laughs> Unfortunate for that statement, it's wrong because The Last Jedi is one of the best Star Wars movies so, ever made. So anyone that says yeah. otherwise can go fuck so, themselves. In in The Force Awakens, it ends <laughs> it ends with Rey handing Luke Skywalker his lightsaber, and then it, it cuts to black. Right. So in Scream Four, we have that scene with with Judy and Sydney. And literally what the writers for this film do is they do the same exact thing that happens in The Last Jedi. All of a sudden, The Last Jedi starts in, here's the moment where, you know, we've had years to think about, okay, well, fuck, what's Luke Skywalker going to do with his lightsaber? And he throws it over his shoulders. And it was a moment that everybody goes, fuck, I've waited years for this, and it was just such a throwaway moment or a comical moment, whatever. That's exactly what this was because they had that scene in Scream 4 which set the foundation for something, and the writers for this one literally threw it over their shoulders and said, fuck it, we're doing nothing with that. I'm glad. I'm glad, though, because that changes expectations. I don't need everything to be fan service. I'm not saying fan service, but there was a reason that scene existed. I know we talked about the Billy Loomis thing and if if I think feel like that would have made a lot of sense too if Judy had had sex not with Billy but with Stu and everyone's there like tying it back to the film and everybody's talking about Billy everybody's talking about Billy oh Billy did this Billy did this and it turns out that uh perhaps one of the killers was trying to avenge you know his dad in some way shape or form and then we get Gail killed instead of Dewey, even though yes. Dewey has such a beautiful death because Judy doesn't like Gail. Um, and it, it kind of has that homage to a little bit with Scream 2 with, you know, back at the Mocker house, getting that it's not just about Billy, it's about Stu. A little bit of the toxic fandom aspect that could have been squeezed in there and mixed in that pot of all those different elements. And I guess... To a certain extent, it could be fan service, but I feel like it just makes it a stronger film, in my humble yeah. opinion. Connective. But Way more connected. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that makes yeah. total sense. There's so many things they could have done to make this movie stronger, but I have to go back to, to Dewey as being, not only is he the centerpiece, like in terms of like the most emotional part of this movie as one of the original legacy characters, but he is the forward thrust the movie needs in order to push it forward, to raise the stakes. And I'm glad they fucking did it. I'm glad they killed him, actually, because I cried every single time I watched the movie because he's one of the best mm-hmm. characters ever. And David Arquette literally knocked it out of the park in terms of his performance. Yeah. But he was supposed to die in the original, and then he was supposed to die in the second Wes Craven one. wouldn't let him die. Well, it wasn't that. They shot the second ending as a half ass thing after the fact in the first one 
And then they dabbled with killing him in the second one. And he literally gets, again, I mean, he's already walking like, the, and ladies and gentlemen, if you mm-hmm. could see me doing the, you know, the limp, the, the nerve damage in the second one, he's in the recording booth in the second one, stabs in the back again as well. So mm-hmm. if anyone was going to die, it was meant to be him because we yeah. know if these movies do continue, Sydney's still alive. Mm-hmm. Even if she shows up for a cameo, I, I, I would not be super excited about that, but we know her contract requires it. That's just how these things work. We have to understand both sides of the, the coin in terms of studio requirement and reality when it comes to scripts. They're yeah. like, well, you can do this, but you can't kill her yet because we want yeah. two more movies out of it and we need to make it more dramatic. There was no way they were going to kill Sidney Prescott. Now, I will get down to the third act. Now, we'll dig deep into it. I had such a huge problem walking away from this movie for the first time, seeing Sydney show up, shoot through a few doors, have Sydney's lament played for five fucking seconds. And I'll get into the score. God fucking damn it. Will I get into the score? Um, and then she gets knocked over a banister downstairs. Okay. We've seen her deal with that before. She is literally in terms of how much she's been beat up how much she's fucked ghost face dudes up the most brutal, the strongest final girl ever. I mean, she has fought with everybody. She's gotten mm-hmm. punched in the face. She's gotten thrown over banister. She's gotten stabbed. She's gotten shot at. I mean, everything literally. And one throw over the banister takes her out. I was like, mm-hmm. no, Gail gets out of the car. <laughs> it's like they just get there. It must have been in Courtney Cox's contract or something where she's like, I don't want to do much action. Just shoot me as soon as... I mean, I don't I don't understand anything else other than that, why why she'd be shot as soon as she gets out of the car. I was like, yeah. she's totally wasted. I mean, other than that, like, you know, the final kill, um, Amber's demise is obviously a, a cheering moment for fans, but yeah, I just... I, I had such a huge problem. There was no like moment for fans to stand up on their seats and be like, yes. Yeah. In terms there of was what, no don't fuck with the original. Yeah. There wasn't for her. I mean, Gail gets her fuck you moment with avenging Dewey's death, but it feels a little on the nose, a little forced. And mm-hmm. we all agree that Sydney doesn't really need to be in this movie, but yet she has to be. That's mm-hmm. the way it has to be for fans, for the studio. And that's that fine line. Like how, how else would we have done this movie to make it balanced out properly? You know, with these new characters, Sam and Tara, and then we have Gail and Sid, which get, you are right, Jeremy. I mean, I was busting your balls earlier, but they get so little screen time together. Like what's the proper way in order to balance these things out to make a movie that is short in length that can make a lot of money in a day, you know, and also please fans. It's it's so hard Honestly, to do. It is. I I think one of the things, and maybe this would have been a little too cheesy, but I feel like and and uh, Sam was really resistant to getting really any help from Sydney. Uh, but it would have been cool if there was almost like a. <laughs> this is probably really stupid. It makes sense in my head, but it's not going to make sense for anybody else. Like a like a training moment like i love the it things like a team up scene yeah 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 like that would have been great and i think and i'm sorry to bring this back to the whole stew tie-in but that would have been a great moment to be like okay you kill sydney prescott which my beloved Stu didn't get to do and then you also get to kill this daughter of you know billy loomis or whatever um which would have been a nice double tap for a kill killer so yeah so something that i i really wanted this film to do and i thought it was potentially happening and then i was i was bummed that it didn't happen and maybe this is something that they can do it in the future for another installment but you know much like the first first quote-unquote kill in this film it wasn't actually a kill it was like oh fuck they broke the mold on that she survived that's great so when dewey shot ghostface in the hospital we always have the multiple killers, right? And mm-hmm. when Dewey shot... Except, except for, for three. three. But yeah. in... Which I've seen, like, fucking 
three times probably total when the other ones I've seen like a bajillion times. But uh, get yourself prepared. Oh yeah, buddy. oh yeah. No, I'm, I don't need to be that prepared to watch Scream Three again. So uh, <laughs> that's not happening. So get ready. When uh, when Dewey shoots Ghostface in the hospital and Ghostface goes flying back into some glass and stuff like that, dude. I wanted Ghostface to legit be dead and then pull the mask off and be like, oh, fuck, it's this person that's dying in the middle of the movie. It's never happened before to where I was like, dude, that's that would be really interesting to me if if one half of the killers eat shit and Mm -hmm. get killed. And that would have been a great idea. Eat shit and get killed halfway through it to where it's like, dude, this was the killer. And then the main characters can maybe think it looks as though it's only one killer. So, like, we stopped Ghostface, that's it. They start living their lives again, and then Ghostface pops back up. No, there was two or maybe even three killers. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't I would, would even say, like, living their lives again. Like, they get in the car, like, oh, we're going to yeah. go off and get McDonald's or something for dinner, and, like, mm-hmm. in the back seat. I, I am there eating me a fucking crispy chicken. I got stabbed in my leg. <laughs> yeah. I'm eating a... <laughs> Give me some nugs. These are survival nugs. Survival nugs. <laughs> I'm celebrating. Let me get a McFlurry. Oh, the ice cream machine's down. Listen, okay. we just okay. lived. We're going to McDonald's. You want to go to McDonald's? I want a happy meal. <laughs> so, I, I thought that was cool. Way. And then another thing that I, I really want them to do at some point, because they're going to keep making these movies as long as they keep making money like this. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Is... Dude, can we have a killer actually survive one of these movies and and trinkle over into did I just say trinkle? Yes. Uh trinkle over into the <laughs> next film, right? To where that was Kevin Williamson when he wrote uh the outline for four, five, and six, because he wrote them as a trilogy pair. Jill was supposed to get away and in the first draft gets away with the murders and she becomes like famous like a like a Sydney Prescott that she survived these murders. She goes off to college when another killer pops up and follows her to college and is like, I know what you fucking did. And so last summer. Yeah, yeah. So she like all these kills start <laughs> happening, but they tie it to her being the killer from the previous movie. So she's having to kill and like cover up her kills, which I was like, dude, that would have been so original. So like, can we in one of these screen movies at some point can we have the killer actually survive? Because I think that would be interesting because we've never gotten that. It's awesome that you you mentioned that, Jeremy, because that's actually mentioned in dialogue at the end scene. There, we don't have a Michael Myers or a Jason Voorhees to come yeah. back every yeah. movie. And she's mm-hmm. saying it right to Sydney's face. We have to get to the other characters and the other actors in this movie because I think that there's a lot of credit to be due here. I think that uh, there's so much to love here. Dylan Minnette that plays Wes Hicks. Great. He's fantastic, and I'm going to say this out on a limb, and fans can either love it or hate it. I don't care. The whole stock sequence at his house where he's waiting for his mom yeah, is the most Wes Craven thing in this franchise yep. since the second movie. It feels like Wes. It's shot like Wes would shoot it. Um, the suspense, all of the hits in terms of like the little buzz moments with the score... I felt it. It felt like scream to me. It was even more scream than the opening for me. And um, yeah. I loved that when I got to see the fan event at Alamo Draft House last week, one of the directors that was there, um, had they had answered a question to a fan. And they had asked the question like, well, when you were struggling with what to do with this movie, if you came in like to a, 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 you know, a corner and didn't know what to do, what did you do? And they literally said, we looked at the movies and said to ourselves, what would Wes do? And it shows in this movie because Mm -hmm. the way this movie looks and feels to me, it feels more like a Wes Craven movie than Scream 4 does. Um, And some fans agree with me. Some fans may not. But the way it looks, the way it feels, the energy, it feels like the West that we got in 1995 when he was shooting scream, you know, it just, it feels like a director that is reinvigorated with passion and really trying to prove themselves because we know when West took on scream, he'd already passed on the script a number of times and that it took a kid at a convention that said, you haven't made anything kick ass in a while. You need to make something kick ass. And the kid was like 10 that was just waiting in line to get an autograph. And when he, when he heard that, that was the moment when he was like, 
that script I got, that scream thing. I'm gonna go well, scary, scary movie, movie yeah. at the time. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go look at that, and and that's what led him to make this iconic franchise. And I, I think it's some of his best work ever. I mean, in theory, other than Nightmare and New Nightmare, I think actually Scream is his best work ever. Mm-hmm. That's I my agree. opinion. I um, but yeah, I think I, I think I think this movie. I mean, these filmmakers definitely took so much time and effort into what would West do to make this movie. And Kevin Williamson was on set every fucking day. Um, he served as executive producer. I was somewhat upset. He didn't help write the script or have any say in the story, but I think overall it feels like a great continuation. If Wes was still with us, God rest his fucking soul. The icon, the legend, you know, it's like, it's hard to watch this movie not cry when you're feeling a moment like, dude, the way the camera turned yeah. right there, yeah. you see that Dutch angle? There's those Dutch angles in the end scene that that's what Wes did. You know, you're like, yeah. holy fuck, dude, they're, they're doing that. And like, he, yeah. he, he himself didn't even do those in the other sequels. It's like what he did in the first movie. So they, they paid so much attention to everything he did in that first movie. And I, I'm just so thankful that they got yeah. Kevin Williamson involved and they, 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 they took the time. Jeremy, you might hate me for this, but this isn't a situation with like David Gordon Green and having John Carpenter come in to write notes for Halloween 2008 Turner Halloween Kills. I don't know if Carpenter cares that much, you know, but here it feels like to me that they legitimately wanted to at least try to create a tribute yeah. to the kind of screen movie that Wes would be proud of. 100%. Yeah. Um, it, in so many parts, it felt like a Wes Craven scream film. Uh, Wes would have never allowed Dewey to die, but I digress. But <laughs> I, I, he, I think he would I have. Know. I think he would but have, it, actually. He would. I, I'm, I mean, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm surprised at how much praise you are giving it because uh, I'm going to tell our listeners right now, when we walked out of watching this movie the first time, he was asked by somebody... What did you think? And Justin went on a fucking eight minute rant about how the directors fucked it up, how there was shaky cam situations where it's like, dude, Wes Craven would have never done this. And like J- Justin very much was not on board as liking the movie. So it's it's that goes to show you that sometimes you have a, you know, a second viewing, a third viewing and it can, it can well, change Jeremy, your opinion. You also know, you also know that I indulged before I saw it. I was so nervous. I'm going to be honest to our listeners. I was very nervous about this movie and I never used to get like that. But with this movie, I was so scared that it wasn't going to work or it wasn't going to be a great tribute or it wasn't going to, you know, fill in the blank that I overindulged and, uh, you're feeling toasty, but I mean, dude, I, it's you feeling (laughs) nervous. I'm just being honest. You you feeling nervous about this film. It tracks and it makes sense because I mean, I I hate the fact that Halloween kills has come up so much because it was such a letdown for so many people last year, us, especially that us going into something else that we love. That's a, it's a continuation. It's a new film that we're getting in the series. Of course, we're like, fuck, don't Halloween kills me. Don't Halloween kills me. Well, this, this movie is going to make or break Jeremy, you know, like what's going to happen for horror movies from here on out. And Mm -hmm. so thankfully right now, guys, seriously, we're sitting on a mountain of gold in terms of being horror fans. We're in like a Renaissance for slasher movies and not just that, but like, the opening gates of like, yeah. we can do so much with this now. Horror yeah. movies are the most profitable next to Marvel movies since yeah. COVID hit. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah. that's so amazing. You hear I'm that so romantic comedies. Yeah. Do you hear that? I said, <laughs> yeah. ain't got no rom-com conventions. <laughs> ain't got no rom-coms. I, uh, I, I definitely agree. <laughs> I definitely agree that, you know, we are in a renaissance and I've been waiting for it all these years. I've been like, we're, the slash is going to come back and people are like, I don't know about that. We've got like invasion and zombies and vampires. And I'm like, when are we going to get the slashers? And finally, here we are in the renaissance of slashers. And I think um, because the newer Halloween movies have been admittedly a bit of a disappointment, a bit of a disappointment, that this, despite my quarrels with it, 
Um, and, and then the directors, obviously, um, I know that they were, they became directors because of Wes Craven and their love and fandom definitely came out in this movie. Uh, I think that it is proof that you can have a new entry into a popular franchise without Wes. For example, I'm, I'm over here trying to beg the universe to make another Nightmare on Elm Street Same. and not have Wes involved, but have people who really care, um, have as many people involved that worked on the other films as possible to make like a really, really good movie in a way that it is possible and that it can be profitable, even if you don't have the original people in it as frequently that you can make something that people will want to watch and for the most part like rave about even though i have my quarrels i definitely am probably going to go see it again tomorrow just to see if things change um it's just proof that slashers are not not profitable that people want to see them that people want to see these popular franchises still all these years later and that it can be done without the people who made the movies for before. sure. You know, I, one trend that I am loving in Hollywood is that they finally caught on and they even mention it in this film that fans don't want remakes. We don't want a fucking remake. Blumhouse, are you listening? I know I, I don't mind. Blumhouse, <laughs> I know that you're working on something for related to John Carpenter's The Thing. I just want you to hear me. We don't fans don't want remakes. We want Requels. Jeremy, I, I hope I, I I pray I hope that someone from Blumhouse is listening to this yeah, podcast. No shit. We we That's don't great. we Seriously. don't <laughs> thanks for listening. If you're listening, yeah, for real. We, I love we you. don't want remakes. We want sequels disguised as remakes, right? Take the title, give but give me a further continuation. The requel. Yes. So yes. I love that we're getting that, right? We're we are, you know, we're getting that with so many things. We're getting that with uh, you know, the um Shit, I'm drawing a blank here. Fucking, uh... God damn it, get with it, I know. Jeremy. Anyways, well, well Halloween, your fucking Halloween, brain? we got that. Right, the new Scream, we got that. Um, you know, with the new... The, We've got the Chucky The Chucky series, series the new... The new like, the there new, you go. The new Texas... Yeah. New TCM The new Texas out? Chainsaw yeah. Master. Like, Which, by the way, Netflix, promote that shit because no one yeah. knows about it and no one's paying fucking it's attention. It's like ASAP. Yeah, it's, it's a soon, few yeah. weeks. Yeah. So yeah. I, it's, it's I, unfortunate, I love, but... I love this new trend and I'm appreciative of it and... You know, for all of my problems that I have with Scream, um, with the new one, Scream 2022, I hate that I have to say that, um, is is <laughs> that, you know, as many problems as I have with it, they, they did some things that I liked, and I, I, I did like the visual style. I liked the Wes Craven feel while breathing some new life into it, and it was a more brutal film. Um, I, I loved the Tara character. Richie was fucking great, too, and I, I, can't, I can't let this end without... Quoting. Jack Quaid looks fantastic, dude. dude he looks just like oh, his yeah. dad. Fucking, dude. fucking fantastic. Yeah, dude, he does. Uh, you know, we should we should re- he should be cast in a remake of Jaws three <laughs> and just play his dad. Seriously, <laughs> I know Sea World's like they're bust, yeah. they're gone because they abuse animals. Just CG all the there animals or do animatronic fucking like yeah. orcas and shit, and just have Jack Quaid be there and like <laughs> then you can at the end you can have like CGI dolphins yes. swimming over a heart. I love you it. You know, it, mm-hmm. dude, it's it's waiting I, for a remake. I, I'd watch it. I can't I can't let this this podcast end without quoting my favorite piece of dialogue out of the entire fucking new film, which was Dylan Minnette's character going. Well, he was talking to Dewey, and he goes, well, let's face it. You've been stabbed a bunch of times. Your famous wife divorced you. D- dumped you, you, yeah. And you crawled into a bottle, and he goes, and Dewey goes, well, maybe you're the killer, because that cut deep. And that was ad-libbed, yeah, that dude. Was that so line good. was ad-libbed. Dude, <laughs> I, I've seen the movie twice, and both times I was like, ah! Hey, Hollywood, ah, Hollywood, ah. yo. Hire David Arquette for more fucking Please. movies because he's he's brilliant. a fucking Seriously. gift. David Arquette yeah. is a he's gift. He's amazing. He's a gift of humanity. He's an amazing. Dude, actor. His documentary, "You mm-hmm. Cannot Kill David Arquette," is one of my favorite documentaries oh. I've ever seen in my it's life. It's amazing. It was one of my favorite films of last year. Fucking love for it for sure, dude. I gotta watch it. I saw oh, oh, DeAndre, you have to watch it. It's so fucking good. I've been looking for something good. Something. something. Gotta Fantastic. get that on my list. But ladies and gentlemen, it's the time. It's time. It's time for trash it. Or treasure it. So this is that segment where we make it difficult. There's no rating of the movie. You either have to trash it 
or treasure it. And I love this because I spent fucking eight years of my life doing, I gave this a seven out of 10 because go fuck yourself. It's either you love it or you don't. So either you're going to press, like take this thing into your hands and hold it and give it kisses and love it. Or you're going to say, fuck out, bitch. I hate you. Starting with our guest, Deandra. So is this movie a trash it or a treasure it for you? You know, despite all my quarrels with it and and the ways that I thought it could have been better, it still had a lot of redeeming qualities. And so I'm going to still say treasure it because I think they still did a great job in a lot of ways. But I just there were ways that it could have been better, but it, it does not belong in the trash pile for me. And Jeremy, as you sit there stroking that gigantic beard of yours. <laughs> um, I, I love huge chunks of this film, but both viewings, I just saw the shortcomings of missed opportunities or where they could have taken the franchise, where they could have taken the film. Um, I Even from just some of the character names I side, like Sam Carpenter, a character named Wes, which was a nice homage. I like it, but... Um, there were so many things that I just sighed and I rolled my eyes. Um, I love slasher films. This is I, I've told everyone because I, I haven't. I was waiting for this episode to tell people what I really feel about it. But I I told people it's very it's fun. Go watch it. It's a fun movie and it is a fun movie. But when it breaks down to trash and to treasure for me, I just see a missed opportunity. I'm going with trash. Oh my fucking sorry, God. man. Now here I go. Sorry. Here I go. The responsibility that I have in terms of having to defend your ass on social media. <laughs> I, all right. I'll have to write something up tomorrow. Yep. I'll, I'll Don't worry, Jeremy. I'll hey, be there. When, I'll, when, I'll it's tell, I'll, when it's only Brady on when it's only Brady on future episodes, you'll know that Justin was like, "Hey, Jeremy, it's not working out. People hate you." So, I, I you know, <laughs> I would never ever listen. I was on a podcast with Nick fucking Haskins for eight years. Literally, man, liked nothing. <laughs> And hated everything. So I, I I don't have any problem with this. And, and Jeremy, you were right in saying that when I walked away from this movie for the first time, I had so many problems. But the second opportunity that I had to watch it, I really just wanted to go in clean and give it an opportunity. And it hit. And then it hit again last night for the third time. And I'm just so thankful to have a movie hit so big for a horror franchise that I love Mm -hmm. so fucking much. Like this is a gift to all of us because this doesn't need to happen. We know that franchises that both Jeremy and Deandra and I love, like the nightmare franchise, other franchises that I love, like the Friday franchise, there's no like leeway. Those there's, there's no gateway into knowing when those will ever get a return again. So what we are able to have, I appreciate life is short. So appreciate what you get when you do get it. And I, I I think that the filmmakers with this movie put so much heart and care into this movie. So I'm going to treasure this shit forever because I was still under 40. I got to see a new screen movie in theaters and it was a fucking blast. And you gave me, Pretty much everything that I expect from a Scream movie. Except for, and I'm going to talk about it now because I didn't get a chance to. Why didn't you hire Michael Beltrami again? Yeah. Michael Beltrami is the core of the sound of these movies. Mm -hmm. Brian Tyler, you know, he did some stuff for, he did Rambo Last Blood. He did Thor the Dark World, but... I, I had such a hard time. I mean, we get Sydney's lament for fucking three seconds. We get Dewey's theme peppered throughout and once fully realized. But what Marco Beltrami was able to create was such a schizophrenic. Like those high strings were so powerful, so terrifying. Um, I think that in terms of scream, like the music means so much to it, and that was lacking in this movie. And I'm still going to treasure it, but motherfuckers, just, just hire him. Bring him back. <laughs> so, Jeremy, you're, you want to say yeah, something? I'm I just, mean, you just... Those, those, those themes, are they're just as important as, like, John Carpenter to Halloween sure. or, you know, you name any iconic theme to any franchise. It, it was lacking. Yeah, it, this was the most generic yeah. horror score. 100%. The, the score was, was absolutely disappointing considering what... Uh, 
we're used to getting in in the franchise. Um, it's like I love it. It's you know? it's like some of those those Halloween sequels that we got that underutilized John Carpenter's score to where it's almost non-existent. To where it's like, dude, you just gave us a Halloween movie and you didn't give us the Halloween music. You gave us a scream music mm-hmm. uh, movie, but didn't give us the scream music. And Justin said that this film is yeah. a gift, and I hope it comes with a gift receipt because I want a refund, bitch. Fuck out of here. <laughs> Listen, without this movie, we probably won't get half the movies that we hope to get. Oh, dude, I'm, I'm half, thankful so. this movie exists. I had a fun time with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm encouraging everyone to go see it. Um, I am the minority, like you've said, Justin. Most people are having a blast with it, and they're fucking loving it, and I'm happy they are. I'm not one of those guys that's like, what the fuck are you talking about? The movie was a piece of shit. I'm glad. I'm glad, I'm glad it's hitting people. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm also glad that yeah. you're not that guy, you know what I mean? Because this whole movie centers around those people, and I feel so bad for you know websites like HelloSydney.com who have invested their entire like life into this franchise, and people are like, calling them like toxic for loving the movie. I mean, there's, there's so many yeah. people coming out against this movie being toxic, but calling other people toxic for it. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. It's like the pot calling. It's the about kettle black. them. Y'all it's about you. Dude. This I love about you. all the horror <laughs> movies that were considered elevated horror in the movie, uh-huh. but, I, but I love everything. And yeah. of course I'm going to sit here after we get done here and watch some schlock piece of shit slasher movie to fall asleep to, because that's what I do. Yeah. That's what I do every single night of the week. But when I want to think when I want some progressive horror, mm-hmm. I'm going to watch something else. And that's what makes horror beautiful. It's a lot of things. Exactly. It's a variety. Mm-hmm. It's not just one painting. It's how many painters can you get in the room to paint something different and appreciate it. That's what it's all about. So ladies and gentlemen, not even as long-winded as I expected it to be. Normal runtime, but seriously, thank you so, so much for waiting for this episode. We were very excited to do this episode because we really wanted to have this amazing special guest on here for you. We know it's a big deal for everyone. Deandra, thank you so, so much for coming on this episode of Brain Stew. <laughs> It's Thanks so much for having so, me, guys. I'm so yeah. excited. I got to be on this to talk about like one of my favorite franchises and just interact with the both of you because the both of you are so awesome. Oh, so you. I was oh, on Thank you. So so where can people find you, Deandra? Yeah. Well, Sassy Sledgehammer pretty much anywhere, mostly on Twitter and Instagram. That's my main. And then, of course, Captain Sassy Media on YouTube. We do have, as I mentioned earlier, Snacks and Screams, where I review horror movies that I've never seen, either new ones, kind of ones that aren't so old, and then ones like Psycho, which I've never seen. So, And then I just kind of pair them with unique and unusual snacks. So I love it. That idea is... I mean, you nailed it. You you grabbed something no one else has ever done, and I loved the first video, so I can't wait to see That's more. So fun, um, brilliant. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh, again, thank you so so much for coming on. And ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're hearing, seriously. If you hate what you're hearing, if you want to tell Jeremy he's a piece say, of That's shit, my fault. <laughs> and you want him to stop fucking singing in the episodes, what Jeremy, if? tell them where they can go. What if? What if? I- <laughs> what if? I- <laughs> iTunes, yeah, we're on Spotify, we're on literally every podcatcher, but the reviews, they mean something. So if you hate Jeremy's singing, if you hate my if you hate my What's tweets, this life I can't even for? take this seriously. God damn it, Jeremy. I saw you going for the mic. I can't take this seriously. <laughs> Head over to iTunes, leave us a review. If you use Spotify, leave us a review over there. We love you so so much. And I wanted to thank all the people that actually participated in our Scream contest that we did with the studio. All of your prizes are on the way. Your Fandango codes, your t-shirts, your stickers. Thank you so much to the studio, Paramount Pictures, for giving us that opportunity to do that. And also, Jeremy, um, I might as well announce it now. Announce it. We are officially press. We are Epic Film Guys is now officially... A member of the press. I'm. I don't know what that means. I'm impressed. I see what I did there. I, I'm gonna put a little press pin on my Fuck yeah my cutoff shirt when I go to with my gym shorts. Be like, yeah, see that right there. I don't know what it means, but but thank you so much because you guys built us up to that level, and uh, we're gonna be doing so much more in the next year. We can't wait 
to deliver more and more great content for you guys. So thank you so, so much. And we appreciate you waiting because we know you're going to love this episode. But until next time, I'm Justin. I'm Jeremy. And of course, our amazing, beautiful, fantastic fucking guest. Look at her. <laughs> there, look at her. Stop being so goddamn modest.